I'm Denise from Foursquare Micro Farm, and welcome to the intro to the Angora Spin Along. For our Spin Along and tutorial, uh, here's what I'm using. I have a couple ounces of English Angora wool. And this particular wool is plucked. And I'd say it's probably about four inches, four and a half inches. I have my drop spindle, and this drop spindle uh, was made from one of those toy wheels, and I painted it. Uh, and this basically is the primary drop spindle I use to spin all my angora. weighs about 1.3 ounces. And over here, oops, sorry about that, is my ladybug. That's the wheel I'm using. The ladybug is a flyer lead um, scotch tension and also it can be converted to double drive wheel. I also have a Luet S17. So if you find that you're using a bobbin lead wheel and you want me to talk about that, I could set up the Luet pretty easily. So that's where I'm going to start with. And we'll go ahead and get started. What I'm going to do is spin uh, in tandem. First with the spindle and then with the wheel. Uh, just for a little background primer on Angora. The fiber that is called Angora comes from the Angora rabbit um, as opposed to the fiber that comes from the Angora goat which is called mohair. And those of you who are watching that are on the Angora bunny spinners page of course you most of you raise Angora rabbit so you're familiar with the five breeds of Angora the English Angora, French Angora, Satin Angora giant angora and german angora and if you show you know that four of those breeds are recognized for the american rabbit breeders association um, breeds of angora and each particular fiber um, differs according to each of the angoras with satin and english being the softest because they have the smallest micron count for their fiber um, usually you can say that the guard hairs in the English are almost the same micron count as their under wool, which is what gives them that look that, that it seems like they don't have guard hairs, but they really do. They're just so fine in compared to the other breeds. The satin breed, their guard hairs are completely hollow, and that's what gives the satin Angora rabbit and the satin rabbit that shimmery look. I have the French whose guard hairs are a little coarser in coat and that's what gives them that the weighted down kind of uh, falling over look that the French have and then the Giants and the Germans are somewhere in between. Uh, the, the Germans have the on wool and that allows for the coat to stand up more than the French does. And it gives it a not as much of a silky texture as the English does. But it's still a really nice soft coat that will withstand uh, the milling process a lot better than the other Angora fibers do. And those are just generalizations you're going to get differences in coats across the breeds across the lines but in particular those generalizations uh, and their body types are what help you classify the different rules from each of those angoras and they really should be very different um, the French should not have the same coat as the English do basically so I'm using uh, this coat from Jack Skeleton who came from Honey Bunny Rabbitry and he is a black English Angora and uh, probably at some point I'll have Jack come in and sit in on one of my spinning sessions. 
So it is hot air in Ohio, and I have a fan on. The dogs, of course, they want to come and sit directly in front of the fan. And I'm trying to keep my fiber from blowing away. Okay, here's the big deal about Angora. Um, first of all, Angora is a... Well, the guard hairs on the Angora are hollow compared to the wolves. And what makes the Angora so special, besides the fact that it is super soft, we're talking uh, micron counts from 9 to 12, basically cashmere micron counts. Not only that, not only is it long, breed standard calls for a minimum of 3.5 inches across the breeds. So not only is it long and cashmere soft or angora soft in this case, but also uh, the scales on the angora fiber, they are further apart and they lay flatter than the other fibers, the, the wools basically, and, and alpacas in that same boat too. So what happens is uh, generally, Angora is fairly more resistant to felting, and of course this depends on the breed, the lines, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, you should watch the Angora Miss video, and it'll tell a little more, more about that. But anyway, those are the qualities that make Angora generally water-resistant, felt a little felt-resistant, and very, very warm. And the water resistant will come into play when you try to dye this Angora yarn. Because the scales in the Angora yarn are further apart and um, they lay closer to the hair shaft, that also means that the fiber is smooth. And it's a little harder to spin. Uh, because it doesn't really grab the way that a lot of the wools do. So that's where a lot of people have problems spinning the angora. So it's just, and it's going to need extra twist because it's not going to, the scales are not going to grab onto each other the way that a, a grubby wool like merino would do. So you just have to kind of keep those things in mind when you're spinning angora. And when you understand the structure of the fiber, that makes it uh, easier for you to know what to do in order to spin it um, in a way that is going to feature its properties and make the spin more successful for you. Hi everybody, thank you for joining me here. I'm going to start with spin tool today. Uh, first of all, it is very hot today in Ohio, and uh, this particular room does not have air conditioning. And actually, I don't have air conditioning in the house. I do have a window unit, but it's really heavy, and I don't want to move it from room to room. I haven't really figured out um, where I'm going to put it yet. So at some point, I'm going to carry it somewhere, but it won't be in this room. I might have to spin in my bedroom next time. So anyway, here I am with starting with the spindle first. And uh, if you've ever seen any of my other videos, you know how much I can't stand pictures or like me in the video. And so, uh, but it, I figured this was the best way for you to actually see the spindle. It's much easier for me to put it in front of me and spin than it is for me to... Um, try to film in front of the camera with it. So I'm just going to make the adjustment. Now that I got my tripod. And of course I'm wearing all black while spinning. I had to look and make sure my shirt wasn't inside out. But despite the fact that I'm going to get stuff all over my shirt, you'll be able to see what I'm doing a lot better in the in the black background. Okay, so here we go. Now, got my spindle. Remember I said this is actually just a toy wheel. Got from Pack of Hands and a dowel rod. I paint it. This is the spindle I used in the um, spin-off magazine article. This is the spindle. Pretty much always use. 
it's not the only spindle that I have, but it's the one I prefer to use. I like this one much better. It's about 1.3 ounces. And there, there's some differing opinions about uh, spindles and Angora. Some people tell you use the lightest one possible. For me, um, using anything less than an ounce means that my spindle does not spin very fast. Um, I have a Turkish spindle. I always wanted a Turkish spindle. I had a friend who sent me one. I tried it and I hated it. And that's because it's so very lightweight. It doesn't spin very fast. And I feel like I'm flicking it all the time. And for me, that's really frustrating. So um, your choice and weight of spindles will depend. Hopefully you can get more than one. Like I said, if you just get this toy spindle, you can make like three or four of these for a couple bucks. Give one to your friends, and then you can kind of try them out and see what you prefer. I prefer the, the extra weight on it, and I, you know it spins fast. And so that means occasionally the fiber slips out, and that happens, and it's okay. All right, now, uh, for my spindle leader, I use... Sewing thread. Seriously, I really do use sewing thread. Um, and for more than one reason, first of all, I have a lot of sewing thread. Secondly, it takes up no space um, on the spindle. It doesn't impair my building a cop at all. And third, if I choose to spin that thin, it makes an excellent guide for the spinning. And the cotton does, um, it, all, it grips the angora nicely and the angora slides off nicely, which sounds strange, but it does. Okay, so here we go. And basically, when I'm starting with the cotton thread, I lay the fiber over top of the thread, and I just twist. Okay. I let the twist build up. Sometimes it will catch on the cotton. Sometimes I pull it off, and it's twisted, and then I'll tie it in a knot. Perfectly okay. So I'm joining it to the angle I've already spun. And when you're beginning, there's something called the park and draft method, uh, where you'll twist, right? Let it, let it build up, then you'll park it, put it on your arm or wherever, you'll pull it out, let that twist build up, and then you'll repeat that process, okay? Uh, when you get past the park and draft method, you learn how to draft it as the spindle is spinning and that's the most important thing is that you have to actually draft while the spindle is in motion okay so let me show you what i mean okay. i'm pinching it off i am giving it twist i'm putting my finger where the pinch is the twist start and i'm drafting it how far i pull it depends on the staple length of the fiber and then i open my finger just a bit and allow that twist to travel up. Now in my case, I like smooth uh, worsted yarns, so I'm not just opening my finger and allowing the pinch to travel up. I'm actually moving up with it. And as I do that, I am smoothing the fiber. That's just my personal style of how I like my yarns. I smooth my fibers, I like them hard and worsted. What that means for the Angora is that when I am done with the finished yarn and I'm ready to use it, you don't see a lot of hello on my yarns. Okay, so if I pull out a skein of Angora and showed you that skein that has not been handled, I just took it off the bobbin and stored it, it does not have a lot of halo in it. However, let me show you. This finished item has plenty of halo. I did not beat it. I did not whack it. Ah, I wish I, well, I don't know how well you can actually, yeah, you can see it. There you go. I couldn't see it at first. See that halo? It's actually a lot of halo. I didn't do anything to it at all. Okay. This is just what happens from uh, either the wash or from just the use of the item. These gloves, I hardly even wear. I carry them, but I don't actually wear these ones. I haven't yet, because I'm wearing a different pair this winter, so I haven't really worn these. But just from me handling them in the videos, they've developed a very nice halo. And this one right here, you can kind of see, yeah, you can see it, the halo across the top. Okay, so 
although I'm spinning really tightly and my finished yarn doesn't look like it's haloing, uh, it, it will in the piece. Okay, so anyway, I'm spinning. And at some point, I already know I'm going to drop. It happens. It happens to all of us. We get distracted or there's a patch in the fiber that's not as long as what we've been previous drafting. And we drop the spindle. It's just a thing. If you do that, don't worry about that. That used to drive me crazy. Drop, drop, drop. And finally, something just clicked. And I remember spending the day as my nieces were at the zoo. And I just carried around the fiber, just like this, walking and drafting. And, and it clicked. Okay, so my spindle has hit the floor. And it's still spinning. And I just let it spin on the floor. Nothing wrong with that. It's kind of like supported spindling. And so, this is a good time for me to show you that where I did the join, I didn't let enough twist build up. Oh, there it goes. And so I dropped it. So let me show you how to fix that. Because it's going to happen to you. It just happens to you. Especially since I'm gabbing, gabbing, gabbing. And not uh, looking at the spindle. Trying to look up at the camera. Okay, so all we do is put it back on. Let it build up twist. Okay. So if this is a result of me drafting too thin, I have to watch now. that I don't do that again or not putting in enough twist because I wasn't watching and the spindle slowed down and I drafted and didn't get enough twist in that spot it's really easy most of the time the spindle will tell you if you got enough twist in your fiber because if you didn't it's gonna drop you might wind up with a spot in the wheel where it fed through if your tension is low enough and you didn't get enough twist and you could be fooled when you go to ply but in the case of this uh, spindle it'll, it'll let you know immediately okay so now I'm joining the two pieces here's some angora here and I have to figure out what end I was at when this guy dropped I don't really know so let's just put them together you just join them together the join is always the same you lay one on top of the other and you put twist And you look for those slubby spots and you hold that twist. There's another slubby spot. I'm going to hold that twist. I'm looking at my spindle to see if it's slowing down. There's another slubby spot. I'm going to hold that twist. My spindle is stopped. Okay. I'm going to wind on. Here's how I do my wind on. Depends on where I stopped winding on in the first place. Okay, now I'm winding on my cock. And, uh, well, let me wind on first, and then I'll explain to you. That way I won't mess it up. Okay, I'm winding up in a spiral. I'm going three quarters of the way up, and then I'm winding down. And I need to be mindful that when I wind up again, that there is enough to put around the hook. Okay, so here I'm coming up, 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 up. And I see there's not, it's not going to hook where I want, so I'm going to let release it and bring it up a little higher. This time I'll wrap it around. And there's a little slubby spot up here I want to get. Okay, now let me tell you what I was going to say. One of the things I discovered uh, is that building your cock really matters. Okay, so here I am uh, at the ladybug, and at the moment we're not even going to look at what I'm doing with the wheel because that's not really important. What's most important is what I'm doing with my hands. And, and I say that because if you've used a spindle before, uh, there are no gears, no whirls, no brakes on the spindle to change what you're doing with the fiber. Uh, and so, um, especially for me, I started out with the Louette. And the Louette has a break and it's a larger whirl and it's a lot of pull from the bobbin lad. So 
what I was doing a lot of times with the Louette did not come from the actual wheel itself, but it came from the manipulation of what I was doing with my hands. And same thing with the spindle. So at this point, uh, I want you to really watch what's happening with my hands and not so much what's happening with the wheel. But I will give you a little quick intro to the wheel. Okay, so this particular wheel, let's see if we can get a okay shot of it. Yeah, this particular wheel, uh, the shop lady bug, um, is what they call a flyer driven wheel. Okay, as opposed to a bobbin driven wheel. And it's easier for me to explain the bobbin side than the flyer side. But on the bobbin side, the brake band is on the flyer. And the bobbins have the actual world on them. Okay, in this case right here, the brake band is on the bobbin. Okay, and the whirl is separate. Okay, so the whirl and the flyer turn together, and the bobbin has a, a break. Okay, on it. So let me go back again. In the how that's different from the Louette, the Irish tension or bobbin led wheels, is this actually the bobbin, the flyer, or sorry, the whirl is attached to the bobbin. And that's how that is turning the wheel. Okay. That's one of the reasons why like Louette bobbins are much more expensive than the other bobbins because it's the bobbin itself that is driving everything. That's where the, the whirl is on the bobbin. Okay, so anyway, on the shock, that means that under most circumstances that there is less pull from the wheel than the Louette. So think about if you're a spindle spinner and you're just beginning, think about it like using a really heavy spindle versus using a really light spindle. There's a pull and the resistance you get. And if you've got a really, really heavy spindle and you're spinning in gore, you're going to get a lot of pull from gravity and it's going to make it harder to spin something thin and that's the same concept here except instead of dealing with the uh, vertical forces of gravity i'm dealing with centripetal force and that pull okay so anyway like i said but we're not worried about that at the moment now so i could tell you all this stuff about setting up your wheel using the lowest whirl for spinning because of course the smaller the world, the more revolutions you're going to get per pedaling. So you don't have to pedal like a speed demon, like you lost your mind. Uh, but like I said, I've, I had a, have a Louette, so I, I kind of pedal like that anyway. But just in case you feel that's necessary, go ahead and set your um, world on the lowest setting. The smallest world right here. Okay. Uh, if you need to... Loosen your brake band. Loosen your brake band as far as you can loosen your brake band and still get an uptake, the pull from the wheel. Okay, you don't need a lot, and I can tell mine's is in the wrong position because it's sliding around. You don't need a, a lot of brake. Um, and most of the time, once I set my brake, I don't ever set my brake again, uh, except when the bobbin is very, very full and I'm no longer getting any uptake. And for life of me, I don't know where my, my hook went. I love my Louette because I just stick my finger in there. But this guy is considerably smaller in the orifice, which really won't affect what we're doing today. But I sure would like to know what I did with that orifice hook. Because I can't always, I can't always get this in. Okay, so here's my leader again. And this is just a piece of yarn acrylic yarn that's what i do with all that acrylic yarn now okay got a nice leader here okay i'm i'm guessing you you're going to want to know how do i decide the thickness of my yarn okay let me spin this back hey 
there. Okay, so how do I decide the thickness of my yarn? I have what's called a spinner's control card. And I don't use it much anymore because now I kind of got it memorized. But for the yarn, it gives you little grooves that allow you to match up the thickness of a single, supposedly. If you lay your single in here, and when you double it, you will get a yarn that corresponds to the words here. And as you can see, you know what, you're seeing this backwards because I have the camera reversed towards me. But if I had the camera facing the other way, you would actually get to see it. So next time I do that, I'll flip it around. All right, so anyway, uh, it has a range. Like for fingering, it says 19 to 22 wraps per inch. And the thing about wraps per inch is that they aren't exact science. Uh, so it's like you have a micrometer that's going to measure the thickness of your yarn. So it kind of varies. So anything within that range is going to give you something that's going to come out quite a bit like fingering. And they're, they're trying to take into account what happens when the yarn blooms. So if you're spinning this, you double this, it's going to bloom a little depending on your fiber and your spinning technique. You know, the worsted yarns don't bloom as much as the woolen yarns do. Some fibers bloom more than others and all that kind of stuff. So it really depends. But you'll, this is a pretty good approximation. And it doesn't have to be uh, rocket science. Uh, you know, nothing's going to blow up if it's a little bit on or off, but it just kind of helps. So once you kind of get this in the mind, you eyeball it. You could also pick a leader that is very close to the thickness of fiber that you want. And I used to do that a lot. You know, I would take the acrylic yarns and split them in their plies and then go from there. But I don't worry too much about that anymore. Okay, now. I join the same way on the wheel as I do on the spindle, okay? I just start turning. Sometimes it grips, sometimes I have to tie a knot. Okay, so here it is. It's much easier for me to over twist on the wheel than it is on the spindle, of course. And I'm, I'm fighting this. So that means that I need to release my brake band. And now I'm getting no, so I find up my happy spot again, and I'm going to leave it just like that. Okay, and, and basically I'm doing this the same way. I'm pinching. I'm, my feet are still pedaling. I'm pulling. And the key to this is getting a rhythm. You don't want to treadle faster than you can draft. Okay? Now, normally... I would go like a speed demon, drafting like a maniac, but I want you to be able to see this. So I have to, it means I have to slow down my treadle line. And which is okay because I have it on the low swirl, so I'm still going to get a lot of revolutions. And like I said, it doesn't matter too much because what happens, especially if I was using the Luet, and I keep talking about this, maybe I should just pull out the Luet. But on the Luet, because the whirl size is um, bigger, then the world size on ladybug i have to treadle more so what i would normally just do is hold on to the fiber for more cycles i'm holding the see with this hand right here i'm holding the pinch holding pinching in and holding the twist back so i would just simply hold the fiber longer so that there are more the twist builds up behind my fingers so when i go ahead and draft more twist goes in so I don't have to treadle like I lost my mind. I'm, it's the same thing I would do with a spindle. I'm holding that twist. Just holding it, letting it build up, and then I'm drafting. So I would do the same there. I'm being mindful of the length of the fiber as I'm drafting. Okay. And as you can see, I don't have this fiber arranged in any particular way. I'm actually uh, letting the draft pull the fiber out smoothly. If I have any chunks, just letting it pull itself out. It's working itself out. 
And see, the, the one of the good things about really nice, crimpy, grippy Angora is it's not running for its life. It's giving me a little resistance here because it's got some crimp, and so it's gripping. So it's not just flying out of my hands. So I pull it, and it's got a little resistance to it. And I straighten it out as I go along. Okay, so now it's time for me to switch hooks. Of course, when you're just starting out, it, it may help a lot to card your fiber and make it smooth because it'll dry, it'll draft easier. I can pretty much pick this thing up and start drafting from it. Now this is a pretty smooth piece. Okay. So I'm going to speed this up a little. And in my case, I'm going to speed it up. Turning, treadling fast produces more uptake. So I can let my brake go. Because I'm going to produce that uptake just by drafting. Or just by treadling faster. Okay. And you can see it just kind of... All I'm doing is controlling that. Just feeding it in there. Oh, oh, you know what? I should mention this too. What I'm also doing, since I'm not checking my spinach control card, is I have memorized exactly how much fiber needs to go into the drafting zone which is the space between where i'm pinching my fingers at where the twist is coming up and where let me stop for a moment okay between this pinch to this pinch right here is the drafting zone and you have to know how much fiber is going into the drafting zone that will determine how thick your yarn is going to be so i'm looking at this and I can see that when I compress that yarn, that is how much uh, fiber I need in that space in order to make that thickness of yarn. So it becomes, it's not just a muscle memory because I can, I hate to mess up my yarn, but let me show you. I can suddenly say, I want a thicker yarn. I'm gonna allow a lot more fiber, see how much that is, into the drafting zone and then you can look at the two fibers and look at the difference in thickness. You can, you can see that really clearly. So I know sometimes people will say, well, once you start spinning thin, you'll never be able to spin anything else. And you know what? That's not really true. If you treat spinning like a skill, then it'll become a skill. And just like singers can sing all sorts of vocal ranges and notes, well, good singers, you can draft whatever it is you want to draft if you understand how the dynamics of the draft works. So sometimes if I get mindless, I may get a slightly thicker like slub in the yarn, which is not a terrible thing because like I said, it doesn't have to be like a machine. But for the most part, you're going to look at my yarn and it's going to look like whatever size it is I'm spinning for. There are some fibers that are easier to draft uh, in those thicknesses. Some that'll fight you and Gore is one of those that loves to draft thin but you can also draft it thick. Uh, so you just have to, to work it, basically. It's a skill like any other skill. You know, it's not like you just fell off the wheel and that's the, the thickness that you got. If you want to learn how to, to spin whatever thickness you want for whatever occasion, just take a little more effort to um, work the muscles and the eye for the memory of whatever fiber it is or skill it is or thickness it is that you want. So you're not pigeonholed. I don't have to add 15 plies to get a bulky yarn. I can get a two-ply bulky yarn. I can get a two-ply two ply thin yarn. And it all depends on what it is I'm looking for. And I can do it on the spindle. I can do it on the scotch tension wheel. I can do it on the bottom lead wheel. All right, that is it for this session. It's like, it's only about 10.30 here in Ohio. And it is getting really hot. So I'm going to do a little drum carding and hopefully I'll see you all in the group or uh, on my YouTube channel 
or an Instagram or somewhere on Facebook. All right, have a great day. Catch you later.